This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardera streaming live from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Medicine in Baja, Mexico. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Bariatric Surgery exclusive event is CT Volumetry in Revisional Bariatric Surgery, Providing a Roadmap to Success, and will feature experts from the United States, South Korea, Peru, Belgium, Georgia, Colombia, Germany, and Mexico. The IBC University of Oxford webinar partnership would like to thank Zoom Video Communications, based in the United States, Laparoscopic Search, based in Tunisia, Bariatric News, based in the UK, and Bariatric Channel, based in Brazil, for setting up and promoting this regularly scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Stryker, Ethicon Endosurgery, our gold sponsors, USGI Medical, Medtronic, Blue Cell Surgical, David Medical, Lexington Medical, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, our silver sponsors, Apollo Endosurgery, GT Metabolic Solutions, our bronze sponsors, Arthrex, Conmet, Intuitive. This is the 92nd IBC webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that is streaming live globally to viewers through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, and 25 Bariatric Surgery and Endoscopy Facebook groups, IBC Instagram, LinkedIn, Threads, and Twitter. This IBC Oxford webinars are organized by Professor Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon and director of IBC education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital Imperial College London and Christchurch Oxford University. And Mr. Bruno Gromo, consultant bariatric surgeon and co-director of the IBC education based at John Ratcliffe Hospital University of Oxford, UK. This event will be chaired by Professor Mario Mashrur from the United States and will be moderated by Professor Jung Suk Park from South Korea and Professor Gustavo Salinas from Peru and Professor Jean-Philippe Majema from Belgium and Professor David Abuladze from Georgia. Our chair today is Professor Mario Mashrur from the United States. Professor Mashrur is Associate Professor of Surgery and Director of Bariatric Program OSF Little Company of Mary Medical Center Division of General MIS and Robotic Surgery in the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is also Associate Program Director at Surgical Residency Program OSF Little Company of Mary Medical Center Division of General MIS and Robotic Surgery at the University of Illinois at Chicago in the United States. I will now ask Professor Masrur to introduce our moderators. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending where you're connecting from. This is uh, Mari Masur from Chicago. I um, would like to thank uh, Harris for the invitation to moderate this session. And uh, thank you to Dr. Ariel Ortiz for that kind uh, introduction. Um, I, I would like to uh, introduce, as Dr. Ortiz says, we are going to be talking about CT volumetry and revision of bariatric surgery. Um, and um, I would like to introduce our moderator for this uh, for these sessions. Uh, we'll have Dr. Professor uh, John Park from South Korea. He's a clinical assistant professor in GI surgery in Seoul National University, Pundang Hospital, Seoul, South Korea. Uh, we have Professor Gustavo Salinas from Peru. He's a medical director and professor of surgery in Avendaño Bariatric Clinic, Lima, Peru. He's a founder and past president of the Peru um, Society of Endoscopic Surgery. He's founder and president of the Peruvian Association of Bariatric Anesthesia, Surgery, and Endoscopy. I have also my friend and Professor Jean-Philippe Magema from Belgium. He's the chief of staff of Digestive and General Surgery Unit in Belgium. He's a past chairman of the Hospital uh, Medical Council in Namur, a uh, board member of the Belgian Society of Obesity Surgery, board member of Belgian Group of Endoscopic Surgeons as well. Uh, and lastly, we have Professor David Abuldatze from Georgia. He's a consultant bariatric surgeon in the Georgian Italian Clinic in uh, Georgia. Um, and I would have, uh, I would like to invite Dr. John Park to introduce our first speaker. Um, after the uh, talk, we will have the moderators um, uh, discuss and ask the uh, presenters uh, questions to uh, stimulate a little bit the discussion on these topics. Uh, Dr. Park, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mario uh, Masru. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, one of the brightest surgeons in the bariatric field, uh, Professor Andres Hansen, uh, who is Chief, Sur Chief of Surgery, uh, Clinica Iberoamerica Barranquilla, uh, Colombia, and Attending Surgeon, uh, Clinica Porto Azul, Barranquilla, Colombia. 
and also a former president and governor of the Venezuelan chapter of the American College of Surgeons. Uh, we should know uh, that he is a global leader and pioneer in the bariatric field. And the title of his lecture is The Evolution of CT Volumetry in Bariatric Surgery. So uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you, uh, Professor Hansen, please. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to, to join you today for the, uh, discussing this, uh, this topic that has been uh, uh, a central uh, pillar of our practice in the last uh, decade or, or over the last decade. Uh, we started doing this in 2010, and uh, Perhaps our first, uh, our very first patient was uh, this uh, young lady that had uh, two previous bariatric operations before, a sleeve gastrectomy, and after that, a revision with a placement on a, a, of an uh, adjustable gastric band. And um, she had uh, a weight regain. So we were considering a revision of bariatric surgery in this patient. And in those days, uh, a brilliant, a really brilliant radiologist uh, who used to work with us. Dr. Carmen Rodriguez, who today works in Spain, <clears throat> came out with, with uh, this kind of, of images after uh, a 3D CAT scan uh, reconstruction. And uh, she uh, actually taught us uh, how to perform this. And uh, we established a protocol that uh, over the years has become what, what it is today. But the fundamentals of this is that the revision of bariatric operations are challenging and difficult and uh, frequently they are time consuming because the anatomic details we have uh, with conventional studies as uh, upper uh, endoscopies or upper GI uh, conventional radiologic studies are inaccurate. <clears throat> and it depends on uh, some interpretation, uh, mainly of the endoscopic images or uh, uh, those by planar radiologic images. So we started find out, finding out that the, the use of the 3D CANS Im images and uh, gastric volumetries were very, very useful in the decision-making progress for planning those uh, half revisional, uh, revisional cases. I'm gonna show you some uh, examples of this. This is a, 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 a patient with a previous uh, adjustable ga uh, um, gastric band uh, which was uh, after, uh, retrieval, uh, retrieved after that. She underwent a sleeve gastrectomy and uh, after 10 years, she got uh, weight regain and uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, so we did uh, this uh, reconstruction and we, over the images, we, we planned the resection and we revised uh, uh, this case to a, a Rouen Y gastric bypass. Uh, you can see that uh, the red lines represent the planned uh, uh, transection uh, line and the tissue to be resected is enlightened, is, is encircled in blue. And uh, to the right of the image, you can see actually the, the surgical specimen that correlates perfectly what, uh, to, to what uh, we planned uh, in the, uh, over the, the, the 3D reconstruction. This is another case. Uh, of a 45 years old male patient who uh, had a previous and Y gastric bypass. He had some uh, um, a, a small amount of, uh, of uh, excess weight loss and he has started uh, having weight regain to a BMI of 44 kilograms per square meter. So we did uh, the gastric volumetry, the, uh, 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 the, the CD reconstruction and you can see a huge gastric pouch uh, with a, a big anastomosis here. And we plan to resect all the, the, the redundant pouch in block with the gastrojejunal anastomosis. In fact, uh, when, when we, um, when we uh, uh, or during, during the, the operation, we, we, find, we found the, gastric, the short gastric vessels intact. So the original surgeon didn't uh, uh, divide them it didn't divide them, so uh, that was probably the reason to, to leave a big gastric pouch before. This is another case of a 43-year-old female patient 
uh, we had um, a, a previous open bariatric procedure and she had no clue of, uh, uh, of, how, uh, of what kind of, uh, of surgery uh, she got. And there were no uh, available records uh, trying to find out uh, what kind of operation she had. She presented with weight regain to a BMI of 41 uh, kilograms per square meter, and she had a very severe gastroesophageal reflux disease. So we did that again, uh, this kind of, uh, reconstru of 3D reconstruction of a uh, computed uh, um, uh, uh, actual uh, tomography acquired uh, uh, images. And as you can see, uh, this ended to be uh, a, band a vertical banded gastroplast. Uh, she was operated in the 90s, and this was a common operation at that time. As you can see, there is a stricture uh, in the in the middle of the stomach because of the of the of the band that was actually a piece of mesh down there. There was a, a slight dilation of the proximal stomach, and you can see this the the, the um, staple line to that that uh, separates uh, this portion of the stomach to the, to the uh, uh, stomach at the left. So we plan to transect following the red lines and to resect all the tissue in circle in, in yellow. And you can see at the right of the picture, the actual surgical specimen that correlates perfectly what, uh, to what uh, we found in the, in the Im uh, 3D images. Uh, finally, uh, this is the last case I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. This is a 39-year-old uh, male with a previous woman white gastric bypass. He um, started regaining weight to a BMI of 47. Um, and uh, the, the, in, in this case, the upper GI endoscopy suggested a gastrogastric fistula, but, uh, but uh, we performed the, the volumetry and we could see that the, the gas we use to, to uh, distend the stomach uh, was also distending the distal stomach. So uh, this is typical of, a gas, the, of, of the aspect of a gastrogastric fistula in, in these cases. As you all know, oh, as you are all familiar with the, the, the concept that revision of bariatric surgery is growing, actually in the last uh, uh, years, is reaching the, same, the, the numbers that uh, primary ruin white gastric bypasses um, uh, um, at least in the United States. And most of our revisions today uh, are on patients that uh, had a previous sleep gastrectomy. Most of them are, are revised to ruin white gastric bypasses. But the, the most frequent causes for revisional uh, surgery are weight regain and some complications as uh, uh, internal hernias, as uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, or gastrogastric fistulas. So we came out with this uh, article, uh, which we published in 2017, and it has today over 30 uh, citations. So we are very happy with this, but th this paper was actually um, in, um, intended to, to demonstrate a correlation between the gastric volume and the excess loss weight after sleep gastrectomy. But we continue working on this and, uh, and we've uh, started finding out that we could, could get very valuable, valuable uh, information of these studies. As the trajectory of the staple line, the distance uh, from the pylorus to the start of the staple line, and uh, more important, the shape, the actual shape of the stomach after these bariatric operations, mainly sleep gastrectomies. And we could find several patterns uh, in, in the sleep gastrectomies. This is a dilated uh, sleeve. This is the dumbbell uh, style or, or shape that is very, is very uh, frequently associated to gastroesophageal reflux disease. You can see uh, here a lung structure that uh, uh, didn't uh, improve with uh, serial dilations and uh, stent placement and ended in a, in a revision to a wrong white gastric bypass. And this is a perfectly shaped uh, sleeve. As you can see, uh, the, the, the images are very eloquent in, in trying to find out what uh, the real, the actual anatomy the patient has. 
this is these are the, um, the images of a uh, ruin white gastric bypass. You can actually uh, measure the volume of the of the pouch. You can actually measure the the uh, GI uh, anastomosis. And actually, uh, this case had a, a, a slightly long candy cane, and uh, this is the only factor we found in the in, in this patient. So after several years, we published this paper using the the uh, or showing how we use the three D CAT scan and the gastric volumetry in the planning of revision of bariatric surgery. Uh, I'm going to show you how is this uh, how how. Uh, we give uh, the effervescent uh, preparation to the patients and um, uh, how the, the study is, is actually due. The, this video was re recorded um, with the written and explicit consent of the patient. And as you see, uh, as you can see here, the patient is seated in the, in the table of the, of the, to uh, of the, the tomography equipment. And uh, she will, Put some um, uh, 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 about a, a 7.5 grams of uh, effervescent uh, a preparation in the base of her tongue, and she is instructed to to swallow the, the, the powder with a small amount of water. You can see here she's uh, putting the powder in the base of of her tongue, and after that. She will be. Uh, uh, she will swallow the powder with a very small amount of water. She will lay down over the table, and the images are immediately acquired in the uh, the CT can the the CT equipment. Okay. This uh, here you can see the the the, the image on the right uh, has been already already shown, but the image uh, at the left is a gastric bypass, which is uh, I, I would say perfect because the volume of the, of the pouch is small, the the size of the anastomosis is a small, but the uh, the purpose of showing these images uh, is that one of the things we cannot evaluate with this. Uh, uh, type of uh, of images is the length of the of the alimentary limb of the biliopancreatic limb. So there is a, a, a slight limitation in evaluating uh, in this kind of procedures. Here you can see a sleeve astrectomy with a very very narrow structure. It's a long structure, and this patient was revised to to a ruin white gastric bypass. This was an interesting case also because this was the image. The in initially we get we got, but um, when we assess the complete study, we uh, uh, find out that the, the distal stomach was also there. So it, it also was a sleeve, um, a vertical banded gastroplasty, and the image the, the image had to be corrected to to the shape that you can see here. One of the of the advantages is uh, that you can see the the complete anatomy in all the perspective and you can rotate the image and you can repeat that. And the, the, inform, the anatomical information you get with this is very accurate. Uh, you, can, you can see here uh, the, uh, the CT reconstruction and the actual uh, finding during surgery and uh, uh, it correlates perfectly. You can see the rotation, you can see the stricter and you can see the cost of the of the phenomenon with a, a slight dilation of the proximal stomach cost by the stricter down here and, and down here as you can see. This uh, patient has been already seen, seen. The other advantage is that you can actually follow the, the trajectory of the staple line. And you can see that this long stricter is caused actually by, by, by a twist in the, in the staple line that that, that was probably an error or mistake in the in the at the index operation. It uh, uh, motivated us to publish uh, several videos on, on the topic that are, are available today in our YouTube channel. We are today actually printing these models. The, what what you are seeing is uh, has been printed about uh, an hour ago. And uh, it, it, it's the resultant of, uh, of the uh, three-dimensional printing 
of the images we previously acquired of a patient with a slip gastrectomy who has a, a hiatal hernia, a slight uh, uh, proximal migration of the stomach. Uh, this, this indentation here, this stricture is not the, um, the GA junction, is, is, uh, th this portion is also stomach. And the, this is uh, the portion that is uh, migrated to the thorax. But you can, uh, you can also see uh, this uh, functional structure here. So it, 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 it's uh, something that uh, we are trying today and you can actually plan your surgery with the actual anatomy in your hand. The other thing is that um, there is a phenomenon that is growing and, uh, and is uh, more frequently reported today, which is that uh, the um, uh, intrathoracic sleep migration. And we are planning, we, we are um, proposing a, cl a, a classification of this phenomenon in, in three, uh, in four groups. This is type one with a, a migration of the gastric tube of less one of one third into the thorax. You can actually measure that. You can see the stapler line above the diaphragm and you can uh, uh, also see uh, perfectly the relationship be between uh, the, the, the GI junction and the, and the diaphragm. This is a type two uh, with more than one third of, of the gastric tube migrated into the thorax. And this is a, a type three. I, I was talking before about this kind of cases in which uh, almost the, the complete gastric tube uh, has been migrated uh, in, in a parasophageal fashion uh, into, into the thorax and uh, practic practically uh, the complete stomach uh, to the pylorus is migrated into the, into the mediastinum. You can see here how accurate uh, these images are today. This is the same case I showed, I showed you before, and you can see actually the, the anatomy and the relationship between the, the structures and the diaphragm. And uh, this is very useful for, for planning the original uh, surgery in these patients. So uh, we uh, are proposing a, a, an algorithm for the, uh, for the migration uh, sleeves, and we will show this uh, in the next uh, IBC Congress in, in Oxford. So, Migration of sleeves are more frequent that, that, that we uh, previously uh, uh, have reported. We are proposing this novel classification for this entity uh, and uh, an algorithm uh, to, manage, to manage this. Um, uh, 3D reconstructions and gastric volumetries allow an accurate definition of the anatomy and the extent of migration. And the use of these uh, uh, 3D CAT scan images and volumetries are very useful in the decision-making process and the planning of these challenging procedures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hansen, for that uh, great presentation. It was pretty clear and uh, very useful images that you showed. Um, um, so I, I would like to have the moderators uh, ask a question. I will I will get it started. So I will have Dr. Salina, Magema, Abu Sadr, and myself um, all um, commenting on your presentation and uh, learn more from you and take advantage that, that we have you here. Um, so the questions that I, I wanted to start uh, uh, with you was um, what were our, what are you know currently in your practice uh, your main indications for this? Do you do it for all your original cases, or you prefer it? Um, in certain patients over the other, and uh, whether the CT volumetry has replaced uh, endoscopic evaluation, or are you still are you still doing your endoscopic evaluation pre-op? Are you doing both? Those are my questions. Yeah, so today I do not perform a revisional case without a, a 3D CAT scan, and um, it, it doesn't replace endoscopy. It, it actually. Uh, complements the information you get in, uh, this, in the, uh, uh, the endoscopy. We perform our own en endoscopies. And uh, 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 as I said before, um, I, I don't do revisional cases today without uh, the, the 3D reconstruction. One of the things is that it's, it's not that expensive in Colombia, OK? We, we uh, and, uh, are aware that uh, this kind of, uh, of studies can be very expensive in the States or in Europe. But um, it's uh, in, in, in about uh, 
three hundred dollars the actual cost in, in our institution. Thank you very much. Um, is there any of the moder uh, moderators that uh, would like to ask a question? Yes, yeah, Dr. Magema, you can. Yeah. So thanks, thanks a lot for uh, this very nice presentation. Um, I have some comment and some question for you. Um, do you just like uh, asked uh, Mario? Uh, so you didn't change, but you complement. Uh, you you use both uh, CT scan and endoscopy, but do you also use um, upper GI series to assess your cases? Because no, we, we are not doing uh, upper GI series for assessing our cases. Uh, at, at, there is one exception to, to that. In some cases, we want to assess the emptying of the yeah. of the sleeve, or and in, in the very selected cases, we use also upper GI series. But today, we perform an, an upper GI endoscopy, and we do the the the, the gastric volumetries, and uh, we find uh, that the information is compl is co components uh, to each other, and. Um, um, the, the other issue is when we do a revision on case, a case without the images, we have to, to try to find the anatomy, to understand what this, the previous surgeon did. Uh, and with this information, we actually save time. We are trying to measure that, but it, it's very difficult because we have to compare with uh, historical uh, cases. And it's, it's not that, that, that easy to, to um, uh, demonstrate actually that we save time using this kind of images, but we are convinced that uh, it's a uh, way more easy uh, to perform a revision on case with this kind of information. Yeah, so that my, que my question, yes, was about the dy dynamic because with this, these images, you don't have any idea of the dynamic of the structures of the sleeve or the bypass. You don't have any idea of, the, of uh, if the patient has reflux and things like that. You need uh, have any idea about the vascularization or, or can you, you Combined with uh, um, injection of things like that, uh, that's another point also. Yeah, um, as I said, there is uh, some limitation on the on the length of the limbs in uh, these absorptive procedures. We today use uh, indocenin green to assess the the perfusion of the tissue during during the, the revision of cases, and uh, we consider that the that, that you can can get information of, 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 of many sources. But uh, this uh, allows us to plan the, 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 the operation in revisional cases. Yeah, I find it very useful, for example, as you said, for gastrogastric fistula, because I have operated some cases like that, and sometimes it sticks to the, to the posterior wall, to the pancreas, or to the remnant. And so it's a surprise. Sometimes you feel off for an ulcer, and you don't see any communication. So it's a surprise to see that patient has communication between uh, both cavities, and that that can help a lot, I think, also. But regarding the sleeve, my question is that: Would you change your strategy? Because um, if I do a revision of sleeve for reflux, for example, and I go for a bypass, I wouldn't change anything with the uh, a CT scan because I would put my bougie. And we, well, we would size my pouch and would we'll do the, the same thing. What helps can you what help can can it give it to you? Yeah, and there are some cases that we revise from a sleeve vasectomy to a CDS. So if you have a twisted sleeve, CDS is not a good choice. Okay, and that's a, a very important point. If you are uh, planning a a, a ruin right ruin white gastric bypass, perhaps this information is not that important. But you you if you are planning a SADI or or a, or a one and anastomosis gastric bypass is crucial to be sure that you that your sleeve is smooth and straight. That's the answer I wanted to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor Salinas. Good question, Doctor Hansen. <clears throat> you have a patient with regain, and you have to choose between upper GI endoscopy and imagery. Mm -hmm. What is your protocol? What would you choose? Uh, I do both, but uh, but uh, as I said before, I, I strongly believe that the information I get with uh, the 3D reconstruction is more valuable um, because of the uh, of uh, it, 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 because of we are talking about weight regain. But as you all know, 
uh, reflux is a, a, an important problem after the sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, it, it's important to, to get, to be sure if the patient has Barrett's or a, a type C or D esophagitis. So we strongly uh, recommend to perform both. My question is because here in Lima, we, we run a, a small bariatric clinic and uh, we do everything. I mean, we do endoscopy, we do upper GI, endoscopy, upper GI x-rays and a fluoroscopy by ourselves. So this in comes, our protocol is to do usually an upper GI endoscopy by ourselves. And if I, if I can obtain the same results with the volumetry, uh, do you think it will be useful for us to do volumetry? Here I can the... assure that. It has been very, very, it, it's, it has shown to be very useful to us. And uh, I, I, as I said before, you will be surprised in some uh, difficult patients with the anatomical findings and you will uh, spend uh, an amount of time trying to find out what the previous sur surgeon did. Uh, you will find some unexpected things. Uh, as uh, Dr. Magema said, uh, gastrogastric fistula are a good example because not, ga not all gastro gastrogastric fistulas are equal. Some of them arise uh, from the vertical portion of the, of the pouch uh, from the staple line at that side. But we have found some fistulas arising from uh, the gastrojejunal anastomosis in the in the in the, in the back of the anastomosis, and some of them are stuck actually stuck to the to the pancreas and after fistulate to the to the um, to the distal stomach. So um, endoscopy will show the hole, okay? But it's difficult to uh, understand some uh, features of of the problem. Sure. Yeah. Uh Talking about gastric, gastric fistulas as bypass. For example, for us, the patient came to the um, to the uh, to our clinic, and uh, the patient complains about regain after by a uh, gastric bypass. Usually, the patient have, comes to our clinic with our MPO. I can do the endoscopy immediately. And if, if I see lorus, or obviously I have a gastric gastric fistula, I don't need any more images to diagnosis. You would be and surprised because it. there are several. I can close it immediately. Cases. I can yeah. put the stitch there and I can close it immediately. So we, we have several cases uh, in which the, the, the fistula was missing. Uh, see, uh, excuse me. I, I, we have several cases in which uh, in whom uh, the, the fistula was missed by the endoscopist. Uh, and the, uh, only clue, yeah. the only clue of that was the, the, the extension of the distal stomach in, uh, uh, at, the, at the volumetry. And they gave us the clue to, to suspect the, the gastrogastric fistula. And the uh, surgical findings confirmed that. Yeah. I personally think that uh, that's a good tool, uh, mainly for the anatomy, where when you enter the patient, and also for patient with devices, if you're a patient with BAM and things like that, you, you, I think if you have, the more tool you, tools you have, uh, mainly for uh, intervention, for reduced surgery, the easier it goes for you when you enter the patient, because you, you can always have a surprise, but you will be a little bit more advised, I think so. All right, I'd like to uh, give some more time, Dr. Um, Abulatsa. Let's see if he has any questions. I think you are mute, Dr. Abulatsa. You can probably unmute you. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well now. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, sure, I do have some questions. Uh, not all questions, but some concepts. First of all, what we hear now that the, the, the adjust, adjustable gastric bending is not working because uh, uh, in this case, uh, the volumetry has no reason to be done. And uh, the second is, uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Andrea said, uh, when you're do, when we were doing uh, the gastric volumetry for the weight regain, did you, have you observed uh, the uh, dilation of the fundus or antrum 
or one of them or maybe or it was like perfectly shaped stomach with just a weight regain if the how can you correlate these um, uh, findings uh, with your volumetry uh, data uh, and the main is uh, the another question is that what kind of surgeries, um, uh, what kind of red do surgeries you were uh, been do, doing after uh, the weight regain or stenosis? Uh, it was like mainly the like classical UNY gastric bypass or some variations like SADI or uh, one astomosis gastric bypass or etc. Yeah, there are um, two what, what we have found uh, when we repeat these studies in patients with a sleeve gastrectomy is that all sleeves dilate over time, okay? It's a, it's a very common finding. And if you measure the volume, you will find after a year or a, a little more that, the, the, that there is a progressive dilation of the, of the sleeve. And it doesn't really correlate with uh, weight regain. There are many other factors involved. But uh, one of the things we have noticed that is that when you have uh, rem uh, a fundus remanent, that will be correlated with, uh, with weight regain. Uh, the decision-making uh, process uh, uh, in to, the, to, to decide to what kind of procedure will, will be the patient revised uh, depend, depends uh, a lot on, on the anatomy. If there is some twisting or, or a stricter will, will go for a woman white gastric bypass. If the patient is super obese or diabetic and the, and the, and the sleeve looks smooth and uh, uh, regular in shape, we uh, probably will go for a, a CDS. Very good. Uh, but uh, so in your practice, in your uh, clinical material, which, is, uh, which one is more frequent? What we have, like uh, uh, weight regain issue problems or some uh, problems with some stenosis or twistings. That's what I was asking. Today, the, the most uh, frequently uh, frequent uh, cause for a, re for a revision on case after a sleeve gastrectomy is uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease in our, in our practice. Okay, weight regain still remains as a second cause, but uh, we have uh, uh, proposed that uh, the the uh, the GERD is the, the GERD is uh, not equal in all patients. There are mechanical factors and functional factors involved. When you have a, a, a manometry that shows that the the lower esophageal sphincter is is uh, hypotensive, you have a functional case. If uh, you have an stricter or a twisting with a normal a gastroesophageal and uh, lower esophageal sphincter function, you will have a mechanical cause. There, there of course, can be uh, combinations of, of uh, both factors. Okay, can I switch to another uh, question which is uh, comes from uh, your answer? Uh, what is the success rate success rate of, of uh, redo surgery in case of uh, GERD after sleeve gastrectomy? Yeah, um, as you probably uh, you are aware of that, that the one white gastric bypass is the 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 the, the uh, standard after after a sleeve gastrectomy with uh, with reflux with the GERD reflux, uh, but not uh, as you. As you all know, also there are some patients after uh, rural right gastric bypass that continue or have uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and the main causes are big pouches, gastrogastric fistula, or st strictures in the alimentary limb. Not all refluxes are due to acid reflux. There are some uh, non-acid reflux, uh, yeah, sure. and can can be uh, bile refluxes because of technical errors or some other factors. Thank you, Dr. Sure. Hansen. Okay, thank you. Well, let's say we uh, need to keep moving. I just have a quick question from the audience. I would like to uh, share it with you. Um, so Dr. Thomas uh, Raula is asking if there is any role for the use of mixed reality goggles, like the HoloLens, uh, uh, to have a better visualization. Uh, he says he actually use it and find it very helpful. 
I really don't have any experience with that. I don't know any of the panelists or Dr. Hansen um, have any experience with them. Yeah, this is a very uh, an evolving field, and I feel that uh, surgical navigation guided uh, by images and the combination of perhaps robotic surgery with uh, acquired previously acquired images is the future. Is is actually today in the field. Uh, uh, that's the way to go. We have to explore those options, and for sure, we'll be very helpful in the future. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we're going to move sure. to the next speaker. Um, um, so I'm going to have Dr. Magema introduce our next speaker um, and at the talk, and then we'll have a short discussion uh, time also after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear friend. Uh, um, so our, our next speaker comes uh, from Germany, where she's a bariatric and endoscopic surgeon. She's also um, very, yeah, can you, yeah. She's also a very uh, well-known um, world specialist for dealing with uh, endoscopic, uh, uh, with complications of after bariatric surgery. And we had the pleasure to receive and invite her to our Belgian, uh, Belgian meeting in February. So. Uh, Dr. Steer, Chris Steer will talk about, we talk about uh, using CT volumetry to assess the gastric, gastric sleeve and plan revisional surgery after sleeve gastrectomy. Thank you, my friend, Christine. Thank you so much for your absolute kind um, presentation about me, uh, Jean-Philippe. That's very nice. Uh, I'm going to try to tell you something new because uh, I think Andres covered the topic extremely good already. But let's see, maybe there is something I can tell you about it. Um, so um, the topic is using volumetry um, to access the gastric sleeve. You already heard a lot and discussed a lot about uh, the sleeve and its problems uh, and about planning revisional surgery of the sleeve. Um, <clears throat> Um, but I'm, I'm going to show you how we did it. And uh, we did this, um, this examination, the 3D CT um, volumetry, or how we call it shortly, the pouch, uh, the pouchography, um, mainly um, with uh, Rudolf Weiner. Um, at uh, the time, he was the head of uh, the Krankenhaus Sachsenhausen or Sanal Clinic Offenbach, where I was working with him together. And um, I'm going to show you, first of all, the technique. The technical preconditions, of course, are that you have a computer tomograph and that you have a 3D program, which every, every single computer tomograph has for vessel reconstruction with this program, uh, which is the IntelliSpace portal of the Philips workstation. In our case, uh, we reconstruct um, this, uh, the pouchographies. So we had a Philips Brilliant CT scan, a 64 slice CT scanner. And what was, what took a little time to find is with which collimation we should do the examination. So um, finally, we chose the collimation of 30, uh, 32 millimeters to 1.25 millimeters, which just means um, the couch incremental per rotation, gantry rotation. Um, to, uh, in a ratio to the captured layer. So there is a, a calculated pitch factor um, that comes out, uh, which is 0.906. Normally the pitch factor uh, is between one and two, but we found that with this pitch factor, we, we really got better pictures. So, and then we did the C reconstruction. This is very technical indeed, but, um, this just means that you get a, a better quality of pictures if you really choose um, the right the right uh, collimation factor. So what else do you need? Um, we also uh, take an effervescent powder. We take one that is available here in every candy store, which uh, has a really good and sour taste, which is easy to swallow. It's called a hoi brause. Uh, but Additionally, we give the patient really uh, butyl scopolamine before the examination. And as Andres already said, um, there must really be an orchestr uh, orchestrated chronological sequence. That means um, it's really, really important that you don't give the butyl scopolamine uh, more than five minutes before the examination, because of course, 
you need uh, the effect of it uh, that the the um, that there is uh, no movement in the GI tract um, during the examination, and then also the patient already sitting on the couch directly before the examination is swallowing um, the, the, um, the effervescent powder. Uh, in our case, we do it without water. It's easy to swallow so that this is not a problem. I'm gonna show you uh, what we then catch with the CT scan. Um, this is what you can see. We don't take any contrast medium. You just can see um, the suturing material here. Uh, you can see the blown up um, GI tract. And what you get on the other hand is something like that. You saw that before. Um, and this is really impressive because it's a 360 rotatable picture, which really gives you a very, very good impression um, about the anatomy. So these are real 3D pictures that are rotatable uh, and it absolutely accurately displays the anatomy. Um, and to have a better impression uh, of the relation to the anatomy, you also can integrate the patient's shedded skeleton. I will show you that um, in an example of ruin y gastric bypass because I did more ruin y gastric bypasses than sleeves um, regarding dumping syndrome. But it, there you can see that you really can picture for picture move um, the the uh, the pictures you catched and you really can see it from every side in relation to the anatomy. So uh, we also obtained in 2015 uh, our data. So it was hard to publish them. Um, I was not as lucky as Andres was. I really tried to publish this uh, several uh, for several years because uh, in the beginning, really nobody uh, was thinking about uh, 3D volumetry, but I really think and uh, completely agree with Andres that this is really a valuable adjunct, uh, adjunctive diagnostic tool to endoscopy. So what did we find? We had in this year, we had nearly 280 um, pautographies. Um, at that time, of course, uh, sleeve gastrectomy was not yet the most performed uh, procedure as it is today. Uh, we had much more UNY gastric bypasses uh, as dumping syndrome is one of my specialties. And uh, if you look at that, the most important thing I want to show you is the time elapse from surgery to the examination. It's a little bit more than two years after sleeve gastrectomy. And if you compare this to ruin y gastric bypass, you see patients are coming with complaints, complaints uh, nearly after double the time. And we had not that much OAGBs in that uh, cohort because this was not um, a very often performed procedure at that time. So, very important uh, patients uh, after sleeve gastrectomy come earlier with complaints than patients with wound y gastric bypass, um, especially in this cohort I'm presenting to you today. What uh, did we find? Uh, we measured, of course, the volume because we were very interested whether there is a dilatation of the pouch and um, the cumulative um, volume was nearly 50 milliliters after ruin y gastric bypass and it was nearly 180 milliliters uh, after sleeve gastrectomy. And I especially looked whether um, measuring the diameter of the pouch outlet um, correlates uh, between uh, upper endoscopy and 3D, uh, CD, 3D CT graphy. And you can see that um, with the um, pouchography, the pouch outlet isn't that wide as it is um, if you have a direct view with the endoscope. And this might this might root from the, um, from the reason that the effervescent powder had not the same extension uh, force um, than an endoscope uh, if, you, if you're really positioning it directly um, over the anastomosis. 
So I'm going to show you some examples also like Andre did. Um, Andres did. Uh, so first of all, a really straight sleeve that is dilated. Um, you can very nicely see how the pylorus is closed here in this patient. And what you of course can see that the volume with 335 cc's is really too high for normal sleeve. And of course, this patient came um, with a weight regain, which I have to say is half half uh, with other complaints, but weight regain is really something that moves our patients. If they regain some weight, they are really scared and come immediately to you um, to get uh, diagnosed and uh, probably also to underwent another surgery. But this has to be completely and strictly planned. Uh, and with that, you really can compare whether there is an enlargement of the pouch for, uh, of the sleeve volume or whether it is not. So another problem, of course, of the sleeve gastrectomy is hiatal hernia or uh, migration of the sleeve into the thorax. And what you can see here is a sleeve uh, that is partially migrated into the thorax. Um, on the right side, you can see the, the not yet reconstructed CT scan. And there you can see there is a portion. Of course, you can see there is a portion of the sleeve uh, in the thorax, in the mediastinum. But what you really can't see is that there is really the diaphragm very tight around the sleeve. So this would uh, correspond to a hill classification one. There is uh, not a loose, um, uh, not a loose um, EG junction. But what you can see is that probably the reason for the migration you can find here, it is a twisted, uh, a twisted sleeve. You can see that uh, the axis is not straight uh, and that there is a, a, a functional tightness, a functional stenosis at the angulus of his. And what you also can see is that there's a slightly enlarged um, gastric pump, uh, which is the antrum and the pylorus. So, the reason probably is a really strong working gastric pump um, and this functional stenosis that pushes the sleeve itself upwards uh, in direction to the mediastinum. Uh, functional stenosis or stenosis at uh, the height of the angulus fold, of course, is very often a problem uh, in sleeve gastrectomy. Um, <clears throat> and you can see in this example that there is a nearly subtotal stenosis. You can see it also in the not yet re uh, reconstructed uh, slides of uh, the CT, um, that there is a, a really tightness. And this tightness means that there are pressure vectors that act on the sleeve and that uh, make complaints for the patient. And uh, we call these uh, obstructive symptoms the patient uh, develops, which uh, of course is reflux, which of course is uh, uh, regurgitation maybe, which of course can be uh, epigastric pain, which of course can be a migration, which is not in this case, but it can be. Uh, and these are obstructive uh, symptoms of a sleeve. So I can also show you a picture of uh, pre-stenotic dilatation. What you can see also in this image is that there is suture material in the mediastinum. So there is a hiatal hernia uh, uh, with this uh, sleeve. And you can see that there is much too much volume in the upper part, uh, in the proximal part of the sleeve. And also there's a functional stenosis in height of the angulus fold, which really is the Achilles tendon in my uh, point of view of a sleeve gastrectomy. So this is more than a functional stenosis. This is also a subtotal stenosis of a sleeve. It's, it's also twisted very much. There's a, a much too big portion of the antrum that was not resected or much too big portion of the distal uh, sleeve that was not. But uh, therefore, really, and indeed, 
um, there is a subtotal stenosis at the angulus fold. So if you compare those two cases, you can see that a sleeve may, may dilate in the upper part and it may dilate in the lower part. And uh, the difference here is only um, the grade of the stenosis. Here it's a functional stenosis, which you really could uh, pass with the endoscope, but here it's a subtotal stenosis, which is not uh, possible with an endoscope. So um, you also can make pictures of uh, sleeve leaks and uh, find out whether they are sufficiently drained, which you can see here. Um, you can hear, uh, you can see here the um, the drainage, and uh, there was a sleeve leak, leak up there. But as you can see, it's very sufficiently drained as. Uh, as the pouchography is Hier einige Bilder zur Sliebe aus Nordbrikette oh, weiter, der von der Ihnen die Twist ist, wird total sorry. sinnlos ist. Er hat die Angelis sorry. Foto, solche Comparables to K. Sorry. Um, sorry, I have to go on because otherwise she's speaking all the time. So uh, I'm going to show you another example, a very uh, tight and twisted sleeve. Uh, I also, uh, I already told you about obstructive symptoms, nausea, vomiting, singultus regurgitation, epigastric pain. And when patients are frequently vomiting, I really want to tell you, take care for thiamine uh, deficiency that's very important in those patients. So this is uh, the picture of this patient. This is an extremely tight uh, sleeve with a very, very tight pylorus. And you can see in the endoscopy picture that there is a paraesophageal uh, part of the herniation. Um, there's a functional stenosis. There is a extreme twisting uh, and a very tight and dense pylorus. So this is our, this is the general algorithms, uh, uh, algorithm we recommend. Of course, you have to take the patient's history, the physical examination, abdominal ultrasound and blood test. If diagnosis still remains unclear, um, you can make up a GI series or an upper endoscopy. And if then there uh, are still questions, you can do a 3D volumetry. But our algorithm was, exactly the same like uh, that of Andre. We, we do an upper endoscopy and the 3D CT volumetry. We don't do very much uh, upper GI series as this is very dependent uh, individually on the examiner and the 3D volumetry is a very objective examination. And if then there is still an unclear di diagnosis, we do a diagnostic or we did a diagnostic laparoscopy. So just as a take home, um, with a 3D uh, volumetry, you get very detailed anatomical pictures and you can very exactly plan uh, a redo uh, um, surgery. And the second advantage definitely is that you can measure volume and that's not a, that easy with another examination, but with this examination, you very exactly can measure uh, the volume and that's very important in patients with weight regain because um, this makes an effective therapy possible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steer, for your um, great presentation. Um, we will have uh, the moderators um, again. Um, if they have any question, I'll, I'll get started with, uh, with one of my questions. I think, and I um, I know that you know health system is different according to countries, and um, of course here in the U.S., in order to get a study like that, uh, we have to have enough uh, tools or indications to justify the study. Otherwise, it will not get covered by insurance. Uh, company, so it's, it's easier for us sometimes to justify an endoscopy than uh, uh, than a CT scan, unless we have you know enough tools to uh, to show that this is the right study for this patient. Um, so I wanted to ask you: Is there any any limitation in that sense? And in Germany, do you have any um, kind of uh, coverage or problems from uh, obtaining this study in the pre-op um, uh, period? 
No, no, uh, absolutely not. And I have to say exactly like I understood, it is not that expensive. Uh, the Everwesen powder doesn't co cost nearly anything and the CT scan isn't that expensive. And as I said before, it's it's the only tool you have to measure volume, uh, to measure the volume of a sleeve. Uh, and of course, we are always discussing what to do in patient with weight regain, whether we have to restrict the sleeve, whether we have to add a bypass uh, situation that you don't know exactly because you don't know how it is correlated with a dilatation of a, of a sleeve. And I think this is a very important question, scientific question, whether it's correlative with the volume of the sleeve or it isn't. So there is a reason for CT uh, volumetry in my point of view, definitely. Thank you very much. Question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Question. Dr. Sir, yeah. nice presentation and for you and uh, Hans and the images are really nice, very, very nice images. I, I, I have one question for you. Uh, I have said that my laurels in your images are almost closed. What, do, what are you finding uh, after a sleeve gastrectomy? What is going on with the pine laurels? This, this is a this is an extremely good question because for me the pylorus really is the the third space that is absolutely important regarding the pressure in the upper GI tract. It's the motility of the esophagus, it's the, 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 the stomach itself, but it's also it's also the pylorus, which really is the third part in this um, in this orchestra. So um, we were really thinking in the beginning of, of when sleeve gastrectomy um, came up uh, as the most uh, performed procedure, whether it's important to measure or uh, to do a manometry on the pylorus to see whether this is um, a factor that influences, first of all, sleeve leak, uh, and second of all, really reflux disease. Um, but we couldn't do it. It was technically too difficult uh, in those days. Um, but this was a, a question that that really drives us, uh, and we were thinking a lot about it. And uh, as you mentioned before, the in those patients, the pylorus really was tight. And um, I think this is also always a point where you have to think about maybe to Botox it. To, to open it up uh, for a while, or um, maybe to dilate it, uh, like uh, a lot of people do that after uh, esophag uh, esophagectomy. So this is really still a very unknown part of the sleep, the pylorus, absolutely. Uh, Professor uh, Christine, uh, thank uh, uh, thank you for your fantastic and very informative lecture. I have uh, one question. Um, I agree that uh, if the patient have a sleeve uh, stricture or some anatomical deformity, uh, this uh, CT volumetry uh, can be very helpful. Uh, but uh, my question is uh, how accurately, how accurately we can measure the size of the stomach because the stomach is uh, very uh, flexible and it's a balloon-like or organ. So some patient may uh, tolerate belching uh, better uh, after uh, taking this uh, gas-forming agent, but some may belch more, and uh, which we cannot control it. And in some patient, the gas may go down into the duodenum or small bowel more quickly, but in some patient, the gas may stay in the stomach longer. So the, uh, the volume measurement in solid organs like um, uh, liver or spleen is quite objective, uh, but uh, the volume measurement in elastic organs such as uh, stomach and intestine has some problems that we can control. So my question is whether we can uh, objectively trust uh, the volume measured by this uh, CT volumetry and what should we pay attention to get uh, accurate measured? Dr. Young, such a brilliant question indeed. 
because this is definitely one problem of this examination. Uh, we, I always told the patients not to belch, but this is not possible in every patient. And definitely there are measurements uh, that fail uh, regarding belching, definitely. Um, but as, as, uh, as, um, as soon as you see really a, a completely filled a sleeve or, or ruined white gastric bypass, you can trust in that what you have measured uh, in the volume. You, if a patient is belging or um, the, the passage is too fast, you definitely see it in the pictures immediately. A very, very good question because this is really one of the problem of uh, performing this. And uh, also this orchestration of giving uh, the buscopan, uh, giving the evervescent powder and doing the examination is, is, is crucial to get good pictures. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can we say that at least that is the, the least we can find, that the image should be worse? Because if you see a dilatation, can we uh, assess that uh, normally it would be bigger? Because you know that the measurement of the pouch is underestimated due to all those factors. So if you see a big pouch, at least it is that size. Maybe it's worse for the patient. Um. As I said, if you see um, the uh, the evervescent powder and you see it definitely, if uh, the 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 pouch is blown, um, you can you can um, you can um, take it as granted that the the examination is okay. But um, in my opinion, indeed, um, the wall tension of of the stomach, whether it's operated or not, but uh, of course more important in a sleeve gastrectomy, the wall tension, which is transformed via the vagal nerve to, to the central nervous system is the point that makes uh, the patient lose weight or not lose weight. Um, and for that, it's very important that you have good pictures with that because um, there is only um, a limited, um, a limited pressure this evervescent powder can produce, but it produces, if you always take the same evervescent powder, it produces always the same extension pressure. So you can really compare pictures of one patient you have done, but you must be sure that uh, the, the examination is well done and you really have uh, the evervescent in the sleeve itself or in the ruined by gastric bypass itself and not in the small bowel or still in the esophagus. Yes. Dr. Hansen, I see that you lift your hand. You want to make a question or a comment? Yeah, it's a, it's a quick, a quick comment. Uh, I do agree completely with uh, Christine. We have uh, noticed that the technique is very important. As you saw in the video we, we, we uh, posted of the patient because um, the amount of effervescent powder uh, has to be taken into account. When we started doing this in Venezuela about uh, 50 years ago, we were using a uh, commercial pre um, preparation. The name is Sufogas, and the volume, uh, the, the weight was four grams. We're using uh, today about 7.5 7 grams, and the volumes are different. And the other thing, what you have to be is consistent in the technique and in the amount of powder you're giving. And the uh, preparation or the, or the instruction to the patient is very important. And the other thing we did uh, just a few cases of repeated volumetries in a period of two weeks. And with the same technique, the volumes were comparable, were almost the same. Uh, of course, it's, it's difficult to, to submit to, to uh, put the patient on the radiation uh, several times just to demonstrate that. But we did this in about 10 patients uh, in a period of two, of two weeks and the volumes were comparable with the same technique at the same institution with the same amount of, uh, of effervescent preparation. Yes, completely agree. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other question from the panelists or comments? Yeah, if I can. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Magema, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a practical question uh, for both of you or for everyone. Um, is it uh, how is the learning curve and how is it, and is it time consuming because if I want to do I want to do that with my radiologists I have to sell them 
I would say if your radiologist wants to do that, he, he it, it's really, it's crucial that you have a radiologist who wants to do that. If you have one, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to learn. I would say 10 cases and then it's okay. Um, the, the most important thing is that in the beginning, you go with your patient to the Department of Radiology and you accompany the radiologist when he's doing the examination. That's, that's crucial in the beginning. Yeah. Motivation is crucial in this. And the, the most important person, person in this process is the technician. Um, because the radiologists will see the images and sometimes they have no clue of what are they, uh, they are not familiar with the anatomy of a bariatric patient. And we have uh, worked uh, together as a team. We sit with the radiologist after the, the study has been performed and we try to find out together what we're getting in the images. I, I show the case. I show you a case uh, in which the image was cool, but we 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 didn't uh, actually understood what the patient had until we saw the the the, the images together, and we could find out the distension of the distal stomach. So that was uh, uh, a vertical banded gastroplasty, and uh, the, the radiologist was unfamiliar with that procedure at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abulatse, I think you are muted. Okay, I am unmuted now. Uh, sorry, uh, that was very wonderful presentations, uh, Dr. Christine. Uh, I would like to ask to uh, to both uh, uh, lecturers of uh, concerning uh, the uh, CT volumetry that. What we have seen today were images with some pathologies like weight regain, gastric reflux, or stenosis, distal or proximal, etc. But uh, do we have a comparison of the like control group to the like patients with the, without any compliance, without weight regain, without reflux? And uh, are you sure that their stomach is very straight? without those cores or some dilated pouches or et cetera, because I have seen a lot of stomachs by just plain barium swallow x-rays where we have like terrible stomachs, but patients do not have any compliance, no sleeve, no weight regain, nothing. And they just correlate with this and they have no symptoms. And also I have seen very beautiful, like straight line stomachs uh, with no reflux, with no dilation, but the weight regain. So when we are talking about the weight regain, it's weight not regain. probably only the point of view that the stomach is dilated after sleep but also some metabolic factors. So there's some uh, multidisciplinary MDT group should evaluate the patient, not only by the stomach size, but also some metabolic or any other issues or psychological maybe. It's my point of view. The second is, okay, sure, there's uh, CT manometry is very useful in cases when we have some problem, but we cannot, we, when we see some, because I have some patients who went to another country, they had, uh, they didn't have any problems, but they just did the CT manometry and they said, okay, you have some hiatal hernia and they were not complaining of uh, any kind of, uh, Jared or some compliance, but uh, they were, were told by another surgeon that according to the radiologic data, uh, your surgery was uh, like some with some mistakes or something like this, and they were complaining, but they had no, no, absolutely no GERD and no. So we have to differentiate probably, which is um, equivalent radiological and clinical data together, or we should differ the radiological data with the clinical data. That's, that is my concern. It's not a question, it's a just concern because uh, not every radiologic data correlates exactly to the clinical situation or vice versa. This is my point of view. Thank you very much. But David, you know what what you reported here is uh, uh, surgery on a on a picture, 
I, I never would do that. I never would uh, do an operation on a, on an X-ray, you know. Um, and of course, these patients had complaints. I showed you today, but I know there's a study from Alexandria in Egypt. Um, they did uh, the patient a volumetry before surgery, after surgery, and uh, with uh, some time delay again, uh, and it really correlated with the weight. Definitely, it's not published yet, but uh, it will be soon. Um, and uh, uh, I hope this answers your question. Um, first of all, I never would do an operation on an X-ray. And second of all, uh, it seems to be that there is really a correlation and this works also in a patient that don't have complaints. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I have a comment on that. Uh, there are two different animals. Weight regain is one, one of them. And the other one is... Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease or dysphagia or uh, complaints after the, the sleep. Um, I, won't, I won't operate on patients uh, uh, without symptoms or without uh, uh, heart signs, endoscopic uh, uh, demonstrated esophagitis or, or uh, Barrett's esophagus or some other changes. But in case, as, as you uh, are familiar today with the concept that obesity is a chronic and progressive disease, and surgery doesn't cure that, okay? Ooh. So we, we are doing more and more revisional cases because as, as a chronic and progressive disease, it behaves as, an, as, as some other uh, diseases as cancer be, uh, behave. In, in cancer, you have neoadjuvancy surgery, adjuvancy and uh, uh, rescue surgery. And we do the same today uh, in, 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 in obese patients. We do that, we prescribe medications, we do surgery on them. We uh, prescribe again medications if they are not uh, doing uh, good, uh, well enough. And we offer revisional surgery or, or rescue surgery if you, if you prefer. So it's more, more or less the same concept. Some patients will regain weight and we have today tools to, to manage that. We have pharmacological tools, we have surgical tools, uh, we have a, a, a bunch of multidisciplinary things that we can offer to those patients. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Hans and Dr. Steer, for taking the time and sharing your experience with us and learning from you that have the most experience in the world with this, with this new technique. Um, and if there are no more questions, I'd like to uh, close with the webinar. Um, stating that this has been a very interesting uh, webinar, so we have learned a lot from the uh, people that started with this technique. And it's, it's good to see how uh, the bariatric field is a continuing, evolving field, uh, and we get to add more images to our preoperative evaluation, our patients, and, and, and we continue to learn more from um, indications and, and new technologies. Um, I'd like to thank both of the speaker uh, today, and I'd like to thank also the panelists for the relevant comments. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Um, Ortiz and Harris for uh, inviting us and making us part of this. And I would like to hand off uh, the webinar to Dr. Ariel Ortiz to uh, conclude. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. To view the complete Hot Topics in Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. And don't forget to mark your calendars for the fourth IBC University of Oxford World Congress, which will take place from September 18th through the 20th of this year, 2023, at the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. The Congress has been awarded 18 CPD points from the Royal College of Surgeons of England and 20.25 AMA PRA credits by Cinemed. For more information, go to ibcclub.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor from IBC Global. Stay safe and God bless.